Hello, and welcome back to Getting to the Top, where we interview transformational leaders about their leadership journey. Today, I have somebody that I've been trying to get to do this for <laughs> since I started. She was on the short list of first people I wanted to interview. She is none other than the absolutely extraordinary Sasha Thompson. Currently, she is the CEO and co-founder of the Customer Experience Company Limited, a company she started in 2018 based on her passion for and understanding of the importance of customer experience as a key differentiator and growth driver for business. But she has had many titles. She's been Director of Customer Insights, Marketing Director, Chief Operations Officer, Chief Executive Officer, Chief Evolution Officer, and she's currently Chairman of the Board of Digicel. She is a multifaceted professional in the areas of marketing, operations, customer experience, and technology, and spent the early part of her career in advertising, focusing on international world-renowned brands like Coca-Cola, Johnson & Johnson, and Nestle. Welcome, Sasha. Thank you, Raquel. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's an honor to be here. I'm so delighted to have you. And I mean, I think there's such a wealth of, of information from this absolutely monumental career that you've had. So let's take us back to the beginning. Where did you start? What did you think you were going to be when you were in primary school? What were the you going to be? The truth is, Raquel, I had no clue what I wanted to do. I remember panicking. I was at graduation in Form 5, and I remember the graduation ceremony sitting down there. And I would say 50% of the girls, because I was at Holy Name Convent, so all girls school, 50% of my friends and colleagues knew exactly what they wanted to do. Well, I was in panic. I had no clue. But I followed the career path and the course of study that, of course, you know, I studied business, you know, so I had mm -hmm. to follow the, that path of business. And that's how I decided what to study based on the subject I had chosen. It just led me there. And so then I went on to study business and economics at university with a focus on marketing. So um, I didn't have a clue. I just went with the flow and I had no dream or goal of being a leader at all. Mm -hmm. I wanted a career that I'd be fulfilled in, passionate about and enjoy, right? That's what I thought. And I needed to make a good living for myself. <laughs> So that's really, that's really where it all started with no clear plan. I, I like that only because I think there's so many young women who are terrified that they don't have a plan and think that they have mm -hmm. to have it all mapped out from beginning to end. Otherwise it will go terribly wrong. Absolutely. And that's what I thought. And I'll be honest with you. The other thing I was worried about, or I thought about, or I had in the back of my head at that time and at that young age of what were we then, 18 or 17, yeah. is look, I was an average student. I was not top of the class. I was middle of the road. So yeah. I thought to myself, oh my God, the competition is going to be so stiff out there. Um, never thought I would get to the top. So forget about even trying to go for that because I just thought I'm average. And the yeah. world judges you at that stage in your life on your results, your degrees. That's just that's just what I believed. And so looking back now in hindsight, when I look at this, you know, one of the biggest lessons that's come across to me that I've learned is that it's not about the A's. It's not about being top of the class. Not that that's not great and awesome. Absolutely <laughs> not. But it was so many other things that I think really helped me to grow in my career, you know? So I think that's one of the key learnings and that's how I felt then. But of course, in hindsight, you learn a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and no. thankfully it's not just the A students that get to the top. Definitely. And you know, there are studies that suggest that the more you struggle in school, the stronger and more tenacious you come out on the other side, right? Because when you, when you sort of glide through school, like straight yeah. A's, you just are set up for failure because you think everything's going to be that easy if you didn't if you weren't one of those people who had to you know get an a by the skinny of teeth so true. the rest of us like me who again was not an a student there were areas in which i excelled of course and there were areas where i failed <laughs> so lovely i have teachers who are like i am surprised that woman yeah. is not laying on the side of the road <laughs> Same, even I say to myself, I'm surprised I have a job. I said that for my whole career, you know, because other personality traits, you know, I would be forgetful in certain areas or not the most organized human. I'm like, my God, how do I even have a job? You know, <laughs> so it's so true. 
I once got 7% on a French test. (laughs) (laughs) This is why you're not an interpreter. You've chosen a different career. So it's okay. There's many other careers to choose. You, yeah, you have to learn what it. you're good at. You have to learn what you're good yes. at. And French was not for me. Good. good. Um, so true. But so you left school and what was the first yeah. thing you did? Um, I actually stayed abroad for a few years. A few opportunities came my way. So I got the opportunity to live and work with an aunt of mine in Vienna, Austria. Oh. And I got to work with her husband's PR company. So I got some good work experience in PR, which was quite nicely lined up with my sort of marketing field. So I got some experience there working in Vienna. Um, Then I came back and I was panicked because I'd spent three or four years abroad whilst many of my friends had already started in their careers, had already been two and three years in the job, had already got their first car and all of these things. And there am I still not back home yet because I knew I wanted to live at home. I wanted to come back home. So I thought, okay, I'm get, I'm on a shelf. I need to get back home and start focusing on this career of mine. And I remember doing, I'm not kidding, Raquel. When I landed in those days, there was no social media and online. It was papers. Every day I had the papers. Mm-hmm. And I was looking through career opportunities, you know, or on websites. They had websites, you know, but not, not, not great. <laughs> and I think I must have done maybe 25 interviews in my first three to six months home. And I remember getting so like, I would say quite frankly, nervous and depressed because the first few didn't go so well. Everybody wanted somebody who had some level of experience. I had very little experience and I thought, so it's chicken and egg. How am I ever going to get a chance, you know, and I could understand where they were coming from as well. So I remember feeling very despondent. I'm I'm not kidding. Who does 25 interviews? I thought, well, I am not hireable. (laughs) They've seen that I'm a beast student. It's shining through. This is how it went. And, um, you know, I think I landed the job that was probably after all my interviews is probably the seventh or eighth one that I did. And that was, and God bless them for believing in me and giving me a chance. SM Jalil and Company Limited. Yes. Unbelievable. Um, Mrs. Anna Mohammed. She took a chance and she hired me. And that was my first job. And I will tell you, that was one of the, I was so grateful to start in a company like that. Local manufacturing, mm-hmm. first of all, manufacturing, which was amazing, not just reselling brands, because in marketing, it meant I was allowed to create, work with the teams. And I started in a junior position, of course, marketing mm-hmm. assistant, but I learned so much as a marketeer. Why? These were brands that were born and bred here from scratch. When I was in, in, um, McCann and working on all the global brands, the Nestle's and the Coca-Cola's, everything came packaged in a can and we had got to localize. But mm-hmm. what I loved about my SMG job, every, everything was creation, co-creating with team members, yeah. you know, and honestly starting from the bottom, I remember going out on trucks in the trade and the channel. I've discovered parts of Trinidad from my first job being on those chubby trucks that I'd never discovered before in my, in my earlier 20 years. Yeah. So really getting to know the country, get out and understand the business from the customer's perspective, starting from the ground up was, I think, one of the best learning experiences in my life. Um, and, and that's where I started. So I started in as a junior marketing position, um, working with the marketing managers at the time on the brands like Chubby Buster Fruta, really exciting times, creating new flavors and oh my God, campaigns. It was fantastic. Learned a lot there. And then a job opportunity came up a little while um, down the road at an advertising agency, McCann Erickson. Mm. And they handle lots of um, FMCG brands and a lot of uh, international brands. And I thought for my career path then, maybe it'll be great for me to sort of learn some of the global standards, get Mm -hmm. exposure to some of the international marketing strategies and branding and all of that. So... Um, while I was enjoying my time at SM Julie, that opportunity came up and I thought, you know what, and then I could get on the non-client side of diving deep into advertising itself. Yeah. And then maybe get back eventually on the client side and bring that knowledge and expertise to the client side, right? So that's what I did. I stayed five and a half years in McCann. Oh, my, wow. One of my key brands was Coca-Cola because of my beverage experience. Um, and eventually after five and a half years, I went, I took an opportunity to actually work in marketing at Coca-Cola. Nice. So that was that was fantastic, a great opportunity, global brand exposures, you know, and all of that. 
However, one of the things I would say from my marketing role perspective is I lost out on the ability to co-create and to create from scratch. Mm, yeah. So th- it just was a big change for me. So while it was a, an amazing company and a brand, and oh my God, what a better and bigger brand to work for and to learn yeah. from. For me as a marketer, it meant a lot of adapting things that we say, as we say, comes packaged in a can. Yeah. So um, lots of lessons learned, lots of strategy, lots, lots learned. Um, but for me, the next opportunity came rolling in where, again, it would be an opportunity to work with a brand that started from scratch, Caribbean born, Caribbean only, build and create from scratch. So Digicel was coming into the market. It was scary for me because I had never worked on a telecoms brand before. I was really into the food brands and beverage brands and so all those FMCG brands. Mm-hmm. And this telecoms provider was coming in and how exciting they were coming in to, they were just liberalizing the market. So they were coming in mm-hmm. to break a monopoly. Yeah. Like, come on, that's transformational, that's game changing stuff. Clueless about tech and mm-hmm. clueless about telecoms, but hey, I'm a marketer, let's go for it, right? Yeah. So I jumped at that opportunity. Um, many people did think I was nuts because they said, how could you go from an established glo- global brand? Mm-hmm. A totally unknown, like who is Digicel? Who are these people? Where are they coming from? Mm-hmm. And to go up against a national provider. Um, so yeah, I'm sure it was, it, was, it was definitely something that was daunting. I did have to think about that at depth, got lots of advice, but in the end I went with my gut. And at that stage mm-hmm. in my career, I didn't have a family, I didn't have kids, I didn't have much commitment. To be honest, I was living at home. So that was my time to take the bold risk. Ah, and I, yes. It was my time and everything is timing. And I, you know, I said, it's now or never. Yeah. So I took that bold move and I jumped over. And so I went in as the marketing manager at, um, at Digicel for Trinidad and Tobago. And by the way, currently I'm the chairwoman, not for Digicel Group, for Digicel Trinidad and Tobago mm-hmm. specifically. So I started off in marketing there, and let me tell you, a whole different level of pace because it's a launch, sure, it's a startup sure. brand. It, it was pace, but the most beautiful thing for me in my career in marketing, which is where my passion really was at the time, um, was what a better way to start off with a new brand. They have nothing to lose. There's no revenue yeah. yet. There's nothing right. to lose. There's no customers. We're launching. We just launched. Um, nothing to lose. And and I mean, really solid marketing budgets to really, I said, I keep saying that, but to create and co-create all the campaigns from scratch as a team, mm-hmm. it was so exciting. And then we had full, at those days, it was only J- uh, Jamaica launch at the time and did We weren't in all the 23 markets and so. So at that time we were in the lead and we were making all our decisions on the ground and every campaign, I don't know if you remember them, it's a hundred years ago now in my mind, <laughs> but, um, they were all born and bred here using yeah. local talent. Um, so relevant to the market. It was, it was so fulfilling to really create and see the output of the team's work visible in the market over many, many years. So, you know, it was really, um, it was really an enjoyable phase of my life in Digital, that whole launch phase. And whilst you're doing what you love, you are seeing how you're transforming the telecoms market. Of course, you're not just adding another brand or a soft drink flavor on a shelf. You're actually impacting lives. You're actually a part of this whole team and this whole brand and this whole company that's actually making communications accessible and affordable. Yeah, that's that's purpose. Yeah, that's purpose. So I completely, completely agree. I, you know, and and. I'll tell you, I was on the other side of Digicel. So when Digicel first came into Jamaica, I was working at Fujitsu and Fujitsu built the billing system for Digicel when they first came in. And so when we put in the billing system um, that was supposed to last them for about the first year, after month one, they were like, we need a new billing system. And we're like, what happened? They're like, we reached the capacity that we had. (laughs) We had forecasted for the first year and the first month. And yes. that was when we knew this was something special. This was something different. This was going to take off. So yes. you taking that decision to follow your gut and get in on the ground floor of something that was just taking off. And Jamaica had gone first. And I know that Trinidad yes. had had a hard time, you know, because of they course. Had, what had happened to the market. Yes. And yes. they were like, oh, not here. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was just brilliant of you to just, you know, and I'm sure you would have gotten advice that said, oh my gosh, don't do that. That's that's going to kill did. your career. 
Yeah, I did. I did get that advice and it did make me stop and think, okay, am I crazy? I really did. And I still, even when I made the jump, thought maybe this is a wrong move, but what have I got to really lose? Exactly. I will gain more experience either way and then some other opportunity will come if this yes. doesn't work out. You just exactly. go break. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, Raquel, think about it, right? The reality is in the world of Coca-Cola, me as a marketing manager in a small island like Trinidad and Tobago, I'm a drop in the bucket, yeah. okay? In the world of Digicel, the Caribbean is the market. Yeah. So the opportunity for me, I felt, would the opportunities to grow would come much faster in a Digicel type um, sort of business or brand. And so that was also another reason that I thought maybe I can grow faster here than in a world of Coca-Cola, where of course, you know, it's yeah. so much bigger a company with yeah. so many people and employees. So that was another reason I felt, you know what, go for it. Let's see what yeah. happens. And then the thing is, you know, with um, Coca-Cola, you have to adhere to such rigid guidelines because that is a, you know, 100 plus year old brand. They just, you know, they have so much at stake. So you're you're operating in this little box. Whereas with Digicel, you are, you have just blue sky, white paper. You are creating from clean sky. canvas, clean canvas. And yes. that's magnificent. Some years ago, so I used to be head of enterprise for Lime, right? Which was oh a, my a, right. <laughs> a direct competitor. Right, right, right. And I remember one day giving a speech where I had a bit of an epiphany and it turned on a light bulb for me and I realized what Lime was doing wrong. You know, we were approaching Digicel like a technology company. And I said, the problem is that we don't understand the business that we're in. And we don't understand the business that our competitor is in. Digicel is an expert marketing company. And we are treating them like a technology company. So we're talking about, oh, well, our technology is better. I'm like, nobody cares. They right. are running <laughs> rings around us. And we can't outmarket them because this is what they do. This is in their DNA. So we're going to have to figure out how to differentiate ourselves from them mm -hmm. because you can't outmarket the marketer. And I don't think that that was something that we ever got. So, oh gosh, well, that's such a compliment. It's so interesting to hear from the other side, you know, and one of the things I would say, one of the mistakes we were making at the beginning, of course, um, our strength was in marketing, of course, it's a new business, a new brand, you know, and, and that was one of our strengths. Um, and we were given the tools and resources to actually leverage that and to make the best of it, right? Mm -hmm. And I, as I said, we had nothing to lose in the launch days. Um, but one of the mistakes I will say that we made and that we spent a lot of resources in, not just mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. um, and we learned it after spending a lot, is we, I think, as a brand, were focused on the competitor mm -hmm. more than the customer mm -hmm. in, the, in the early years, which is a kind of bit of what you're saying a little bit differently. Yeah. But... Those are one of the mistakes I think we made in the early days. We learned yeah. it the hard way and we learned it very quickly. So if you look back, I remember the UE University mm -hmm. reaching out to me and my team to say, can you share those campaigns with us? We're getting it from um, Lime as well in those days, right? Mm -hmm. We're getting it from the competition too, but we want to teach these lessons about this kind of aggressive attack marketing style in our classes. Yeah. And I thought, is that actually a good thing? Right. Because, you know, it was with the two companies at one point probably just attacking each other and not even focusing mm -hmm. on, on the customer who, who we're in the business for and why yeah and what is our biggest purpose yeah. and so we ended up fighting each other and responding so yeah. responding to each other's ads in those days yeah and spending more and more attacking each other until one day we sat on our team and realized what are we doing yeah and we totally took a flip approach yeah. and we thought okay let's focus on the customer who we're delivering for and why, what are their needs? What are the gaps yeah. in the market? What do they care about? Listening to their needs. And that's when the game changed. That's when we started to take over market share because yeah. we were just fighting and shouting and, and the customers couldn't care less about who we say we better. Who cares about who's better? Are you delivering and bringing to me what I need for, my, for me to communicate and to connect? Yeah. And so that was one of the business, that was one of the, mistakes and I'm guilty of it I was in the marketing team in those days you know and it was pace and it was respond quickly I remember going to the 
the newspaper houses at 4 a.m. waiting for them to go to because we have to respond. Like it was really, it was a marketing war, advertising war. And so, you know, we learned that lesson and we had to shift and adjust to what was important and what mattered for the business and our customers very quickly. No, so I'm inter- and it's interesting to hear your version of it. And that made me really remember that's one of the big shifts we made. And we had to do it quickly. <laughs> No, I think some of the best lessons are, and some of the things that we perceive as mistakes are actually some of the best lessons. And sometimes, you know, people are like, oh, that was such an expensive mistake. And I'm like, you know, Harvard isn't cheap. It isn't. Right. (laughs) If if you're going to learn a lesson, make sure you get it. And sometimes when when you have to pay the price, it's very, very easy. I I was also a consultant when I left uh, Cable and Wireless Lime Right. And I was helping Claro in setting up their outdoor (laughs) (laughs) advertising. And that was when, listen to me, outdoor advertising, newspaper and radio, they were just printing money from these three organizations attacking each other. And it was just, it was so insane. It was so insane. And you're right. You know, yeah, like you forget who it's about. You forget, you forget who it's about. You forget who yeah. it's about. And I, I even think in some cases, just these two companies on the ground in Trinidad drove the prices of outdoor advertising, radio advertising, TV advertising out of whack. Mm-hmm. So much so because the other markets did not have the same type of competition as we did. It right. wasn't a local um, government uh, supplier type thing, right? So yeah. it, it is usually private company versus private company in many of the other markets. So we had a different game and a different level of competition. And what I realized is how I knew this, I realized this was happening over time, is that we would compare market expenses and budgets as you would, as Mm -hmm. more and more markets launch for marketing spend. And so the group would obviously compare billboards and advertising and every kind of marketing expense. And we were always out of work. Right. Um, and I would say, but how are we so out of work? I'm talking about 50% more expensive back wow. in those days yeah. for certain things, certain advertising media. Yeah. Um, and I remember billboard was a big spend and cost no social media in the early days. And so, you know, we were literally painting the town red, right? <laughs> and at the time, maybe it was right. But what that also did is the impact of that was driving all the prices for all of it up. Now, good for the suppliers, I suppose, but all of the other brands and businesses were impacted. So if you were whatever, if you were a Carib or a Coca-Cola or whoever you were, you know, all yeah, the prices of our yeah. sponsorships of events went out of work as well. Like, yeah. you know, what we were paying to sponsor events. And so, you know, in my day in Coke, we used to pay a little 10,000 TT to get involved and sponsor. By the time, you know, we were in our third or fourth year of Digicel and the wars that were going on. And so, and competing for these events, I mean, we were probably paying that 10,000 was 100,000. Wow. So you really had to take a rain check and yeah. really rethink. And as you started to mature in the market, of course, as well, you know, change yeah. strategy, of course, will change consumer needs, change consumer behavior, the way they consume media was changing. So you adapt. But some of those are the lessons you learned along the way and some of the impact you had. So, you know, besides all of the positive impacts, I mean, um, other things that we change a lot in the market. So, um, so interesting times. So I suppose in talking about the career path, then obviously from within Digicel, that's when Mm -hmm. the opportunities came. And after my marketing manager role, that is when I got an opportunity a few years in, um, Mm -hmm. to take up the chief operations officer role and then CEO role. And that's really the career in a nutshell. And, um, now for the past six years, I've started my company, as you mentioned in the beginning, um, but I still sit as chairwoman on the digital Trinidad and Tobago board. Yeah. So that's the career path in a nutshell. <laughs> that's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. You know, it's mm-hmm. interesting when you were talking about the, the sponsorship and the prices going through the roof and, and what that looked like. One of the things that I, I wish young women coming up in their careers would understand is um, when you approach someone to either sponsor you or mentor you or support you in some way and you would have been inundated with those kinds of things what Mm. do you expect because I feel like they tend to approach it from the standpoint of hey this is what I need versus 
I see you and what you're doing and I understand what you need. And here's how I fill that need. Yeah. So, and you're, so yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what has been your experience in people approaching you for sponsorship, for mentoring, for those kinds of things? And what do you expect? Uh, uh, and maybe you, 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 you get exactly what you're expecting or hoping for, or maybe it's yeah. different. I think the way brands look at sponsorship has evolved and changed over time. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole idea of sustainability, mm -hmm. um, so investing in things that make sense on many fronts. Yeah. In the early days, to be very fair, and I used to say this to a lot of those partners that would approach us for sponsorship. I always, my advice to them would be, and in the early days, we just threw money. We, sure, sure, we want to help everybody, want to get involved in everything, all of mm -hmm. that. Obviously, in hindsight, both from their perspective, I would think from a sponsor's perspective, if you are not developing a proposal for whatever it is, whether it's an event or some kind of forum, that in itself, the model isn't sustainable without sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I think the model is at huge risk and it is somewhat flawed. Yeah. For me, the sponsorship is to help build your brand as well. So if you go to a brand like a Digicel, it's not the cash alone. It's the association of the brand that helps you to become seen and visible. Yes. Of course, you will get the marketing support. So again, visibility and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's fantastic. But what if do these things never last forever? Yeah. They're all relationships over time because the brand evolves over time, customers, your event might evolve. So you should always start coming with a proposal where this is a model because it's going to deliver a certain gap in the market and a need. It fits in with your brand's philosophy and strategy based on what we see. Okay, or, or this is what our philosophy is. Will it fit with yours? You come and ask the question. Mm. We want you to come on board because we think it's a great fit. It is something that's going to be sustainable because of X, Y, and Z, and it's going to impact the, the participants of the event, but more so people beyond the event and why and how. Because every event or any activity or any sponsorship with the digital life and world we live can now impact beyond inside the event alone yes. or the activity or the forum or the project. So now that we look at those things, I always say, yes, don't ever come and say, I'm throwing this, I have this project, it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be an event. Yeah. It's going to cost a million dollars. Can you give me 500,000? Yeah. You never start like that. And in the early days, I think there was ones who were less experienced. That's how they did approach it. Right. You know, you completely have to flip again. What is purpose? What is the reason behind it? Who are we impacting and for what? Yes. How? And then, right. And is it sustainable beyond this one date or this one project? Everybody's talking sustainability. And I think anybody who's jumping into any type of project any yeah. event needs to think about that first because no brand is jumping into one-offs anymore it doesn't make sense no right and remember the money we get to invest comes from our customers as well yes yes it's not the brand's money i mean yes of course but we're there to invest in the technology to serve our customers better first always right try to bring them the, what bring if something launches new in the us we better be there ahead of the game here right, right? whether it's the 3g the 4g the 5 whatever it is that has to be our focus first and yeah. if whatever you are bringing to the table can add value to the customers we serve then that makes sense because our customers are are that's who's keeping us going and that's yeah what we're here for so now we don't just think of let's just slap the brand on anything right so I do think one, the way you model your events, sponsorships and projects needs to change and flip from who it's impacting for what and for how long. Mm -hmm. And as you know, all those ESG elements are becoming way more important now. And I think companies are not going to be allowed to be partnered and sponsored with projects that don't actually touch on and deliver on some of those ESG goals. Yeah. So you have to completely keep up with the trends of the world, not just me, the brand or the business or my customers or the business I'm in. You have to really align and think much bigger rather than, I still get an email. First of all, I never look at a sponsorship via an email. I want a meeting, a phone call, bring it to life for me. Yeah. And that's how it gets started. And I'll tell you a story. Once some, a team came to me while I was in marketing at Digital, the marketing role, and they came and they brought, um, you might remember them, and I don't, I don't mind mentioning them because I love innovation and I love mm -hmm. um, 
um, brave entrepreneurs who go brave to, 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 to Lord, bring something new to the market. So there was a company called first.com. I don't even remember them. Yes, yes, yes. yes this yes. young team of bright people came to us and they said, yes, they started with that approach. There's this amazing platform that already had the technology developed. It was impressive. It was like the Caribbean Yelp. Yes. Um, and we were very impressed by the team that had presented this proposal to us about this new tech and I'm not sure we're a tech company of oh God, this is going to be great yeah. for our customers and for the market and for businesses. So I thought, how exciting. And as I tell you about timing, at that time, Digicel was in a place where we were looking to invest in young tech startups. So nice. their timing was perfect. Our timing was perfect. And at that point, I said, you know what? They asked, would you sponsor us and sponsor the pages? Yeah. And I said, look, let's have some further conversations. I really like where you're going. I like the bigger picture of the impact of where this could go. Mm -hmm. Why don't we talk investment beyond sponsorship? Because we were seeing an opportunity for bigger impact for both. Yes. And so we actually made an investment in that company at that time. So you see, they came just asking for a sponsorship. Yeah. So, you know, you really have to think bigger of where things could go in five, mm -hmm. 10 years and then come with your proposal or think about how you structure it. Yeah. And you don't miss an opportunity. So even if you're pitching for sponsorship, mm -hmm. that is, that's the bare minimum, right? That's it the could, bare minimum. It could be so much bigger and coming in and having that conversation, creating those touch points, finding that alignment, Yes. you know, with yes. the two brands, all of that. Oh, I, I love that. I think Absolutely. that, that. You know, I want to ask you a question, but I also want to go back because I feel like we've learned so much in this conversation. So when you went from marketing manager to operations to CEO, you would have grown with this brand from, from jump. So from that standpoint, it should have been fairly okay. You knew the people, but this, this organization is growing really quickly. And these are yes. areas that you don't know as well. Absolutely. What was that like for you? I'll tell you the truth, right? First of all, I love marketing. I have a passion for it. I love what we were doing. I mean, we were, it was really, I would say I was so fulfilled in that role. I was enjoying it, loved my team, great team. Um, and there was always new, something new coming to the market. So I was really quite still fulfilled and motivated in that role. So the truth be told is, at one point, there was some change in leadership and I was approached to be the COO in my uh, maybe two or three years after marketing director position. And I said, no, for that exact reason, Rachel. I'm like, are you wow. mad? I don't have a clue about the rest of the operation leading it. I mean, I have started to build knowledge over time and so on. Um, and one of the great things about being in my role, but I'll tell you, so when that opportunity came, I said, absolutely not, I'm not ready. And by the way, mm -hmm. I'm like enjoying my role, right? And again, as I said, it's about, it's about what you love, it's the passion, yeah. it's driving, it's seeing success coming from it, it's, it's feeling the energy from your team. And that's what was driving me. It wasn't about yeah. getting a promotion at the next job or, you know, um, something. It, that wasn't the core focus for me. Mm -hmm. um, but what my role in marketing allowed me to do, and I think that's great for those who are in marketing, is we tend to connect with so many other areas of the business. Mm -hmm. And I was very curious all the time, sometimes probably mm. too nosy, as they would say, <laughs> stay out of our business. But I would ask a million questions. So every time mm. I would have to liaise with all the departments, think about it, finance for my budgets and for my approvals of payments and so on, purchase orders. I'd have to deal with technical all the time, what we communicate and who and what and the technology we advertise. I'd have to, so I'm liaising in the marketing team and all of my marketing team, get the, we get the benefit of leasing with so many other areas of the business. And I'll tell you something, you always hear about climbing the corporate ladder. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that is actually possible first without navigating the corporate web, mm. right? And I would tell you why I said no first to that promotion mm -hmm. to CEO is I did not feel like I navigated that web enough. I didn't feel ready. I felt there were areas that I needed to get to know better. Maybe I mm -hmm. could have jumped in a boat and swam and in a sea and swam and figured it out. I don't know. Or I might have drowned. But what <laughs> I did is I chatted with leadership and I asked, can I have the opportunity for the next year to work closely with some of these other teams that I don't feel I have great knowledge in the business about? Right. Mm -hmm. Because if you're getting to lead it, I feel like I'd be a traitor. I don't have experience in that right area. So that's what we did. We set out a career development path mm -hmm. for the areas I felt weaker in mm -hmm. and that I wanted to gain more knowledge in. And so 
uh, beyond getting, uh, you know, navigating that web, being curious, getting to meet and learn, learn from all the other departments. Those couple areas I wasn't comfortable with. We set a plan for me to get to learn and grow, and I started participating in all the team meetings, track planning, all those things. Nice. So I felt that the company worked with me to, I suppose, gain that knowledge and those skills. So then, when the opportunity came, a couple of years later, I felt a lot more comfortable going the role. I was nervous about not enjoying my role as much because, I mean, how could I leave marketing? Right. How could I leave marketing? So the balance was, I they asked me to keep marketing. Operations ah. doesn't normally have marketing. Right, marketing, right. Right, or manage marketing. So the the, the deal was marketing will stay with me. Phew, I could sleep. Mm -hmm. And um, but then I will take on other areas like, you know, the call center, the whole customer mm -hmm. service and customer experience, commercial products, a few other areas that I had felt I got more comfortable with at the time. And the biggest shift wasn't actually the work in itself, because each of those teams had fantastic leaders at the top, fantastic right. managers. So they were teaching me. I was just helping to guide and make decisions. Right. So I, that was the easy part. But the toughest part, to be honest, Raquel, and I'm sure you've heard this before, was I moved from managing or leading a team of seven and eight people in mm -hmm. marketing to over 140. Wow. So for me, that's where the biggest, I would say, adjustment in the transition came. And that's where I needed to really get some training in the, in the people management and people leadership yeah. very quickly. Because what I was worried about, which is the job and the knowledge, was actually the least of my worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the challenging part was managing, um, just moving from seven to one forty, yeah. right? Um, and so that was probably one of the biggest shifts and adjustments for me. And 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 I think that's the that was the part in the end that I think moving rules I learned and grew the most in. Mm -hmm. You know, because any day I didn't need to know, be an expert in customer service or call you center customer, or yeah, IVRs. You, you I didn't had to be expert already. Expert yeah. Yes. So where I had to spend a lot of time is in, is in that upskilling and training and actually leading and bringing teams together. You know, um, but in my, my style has always anyway been collaborative. So anyway, I just love collaborating, sharing ideas. You know. Um, there's a there's a soccer player, female soccer player in in the US and she's retired now. Her name is um Abby Wambach. No! I'm a huge Abby Wambach fan. I just read her book forward. And I believe I in a, something her. she said. Yeah. And she said, I never scored a goal in my life without getting a pass from someone else. That is yeah. me in print. I never scored a goal in life without getting a pass from somebody else yeah. in my team, whether it was somebody who was, you know, um, same level, a boss, somebody. I, it was always collaborating, working in teams. And that's what actually keeps me going, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think that was, that's what is my leadership style and my approach. And um, that's the part that I think I learned most um, when I shifted roles. And then of course the CEO to CEO transition was a little easier. Right, right. That having already gone through that big transition, so I think it was so great getting the opportunity to first be that COO first, and not just getting to jump, having to jump yeah. in a CEO role. That might have been a whole different kettle of fish, <laughs> right? Because now you're dealing with boards and totally different levels. I always had the buffer of the CEO. Yeah, you know. No, I, I've been so, talking to um, I've talk, been talking to some people about you know you think you think oh I want to be my own boss I want to be a CEO and I'm like listen when you move from any job to see you then you get 10 to 12 to however many bosses because you now have yes. a board to report to um so that's a me. whole different kettle of fish but I want to close by asking you what's the best advice and I feel like we have so much more to cover I've learned so much in this process <laughs> but what's the best advice you've ever received honestly I have received so much good advice over the time, mm -hmm. but if I want to think about what, which advice helped me through my career to move, mm -hmm. move up, I would say it's so many of the people, the younger generation are coming in and what mm -hmm. they're thinking a lot of the times, not every, in every case, of course, you know, right yeah. But so many times they're thinking, okay, in, I will tell you this in the interview, the questions are changing. So if I start off in this role, how quickly could I get to the next? 
Yeah. I'm like, what kind of a question is that in an interview? <laughs> First of all, let's see if you could even shine in this role, yeah. excel, add value, and you yourself can grow, right? Because none of this stuff in a job you learn in, in, in university. Right. I'm sorry, 80% of your success is what you learn on the job, right? Yep. In doing the work itself from other people and from continuously upskilling yourself through courses and reading, okay? Sure. Not yeah. from university. So you're coming in, especially your early career, right? Yeah. And your first question is that, okay? Mm -hmm. How quickly will I get to my next job? Da -da 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 -da, right, how it goes. The best advice I was given, and I think it has really worked for me, is how I focus is. I never went into any job thinking I cannot wait to think of, go to the next really in fact i was the reverse i don't want to lead that was never my goal really right i don't want to lead that's not my goal i'm excited about marketing i study that and i'm going to be the best at it if i could right. that was my goal that was my highest ultimate ultimate goal no lie not to lead or be a ceo and so the advice i got was whatever you choose to do and in my case it was marketing let's say starting yeah. my career you just go in there Focus on the job at hand mm -hmm. and what you as a team are trying to achieve as a goal and go after it with everything you have mm -hmm. and leave out all the noise around you because you will get noise, you will get toxicity, you'll have people trying to put you a different direction, tell you the company is trying to milk you, all that stuff, I got all of that. Focus on your job, your goal, winning any game at the current role you're in, whatever it is, and naturally that promotion will come because I never wanted the promotion to look for it. In fact, I was pushing back. I almost would say I got pushed into it and I was like, oh my God, did I make a bad move? Am I gonna fail my teams? But I'll tell you the advice is, stop going in and thinking of the next three years for you and what you could get out of it mm. and your next promotion. Go in, put your best into that role. Always try to win any game, right? Put your best and the next, Sure, people will see that. They will see that. You will, they will see you're here for a bigger goal, not just the paycheck or the promotion. Mm -hmm. And you will be pulled through. Boy, I, I don't know. <laughs> so can I tell you, this would be the first time that somebody shared, that there was one other time that somebody shared advice with me that I wasn't sure I agreed with. And this one, I'm not sure. Because, and I'll tell you why. I love it. And I think you're right that people need to come in and they need to focus and they need to work on being the best that they can at the current job because there is no there is no substitute for that if you're not passionate if you're not bought in if you're not committed to doing the thing you came in to do you're not going to do it well you're not going to deliver it you're not going to enjoy it and and that will be visible here's where here's where i start to go a <laughs> little bit a little bit to the left Never right heard. it is that what I find is that people talk about the glass ceiling, but they don't talk about the sticky floor, right? Which is mm -hmm. where women come into a job, they excel, and they're almost stuck there by virtue of their success and aren't allowed to elevate because, but I need you here. I need you in this middle management because we see so many incredible women who come into organizations, incredible women in middle management, and then somehow... When you look at the C-suite level, globally, pick any country, it is the, the gender balance is just not there at the leadership or at the board level. So if we were relying on this organic, someone will see you and pull you through, I feel like over the last 50 years, we would have achieved gender diversity. So for me, it is, I think, yes, do the absolute best in that role, kill it but understand that if you feel stuck then you need to be willing to understand your own value and move through and if it's um, not and if you're not moving up move sideways move be do what you did in being broaden your scope understand more of the organization if you're not able to move if you're not able to grow then move to another organization and I think we are saying the same thing because one okay. doesn't go without the other and there are different mm -hmm. circumstances as well, right? Sure. Because there are many options in that case. So let's say I didn't do what you just said. Try mm -hmm. to learn across the organization. Try to become visible because it might be one human stopping you in your team. Mm -hmm. But that's not a human that grew me. Yeah. Remember I spoke about do your best. Continue to be curious. 
-hmm. you gave you, you asked me for one piece of advice but throughout i gave many yes different pieces yes, of yes. advice and one of them was be curious because yes you might get that one person that don't want to see you go ahead mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. no matter what but that's not the person that's making a decision every time yeah who get who went, it wasn't my marketing boss or it wasn't my that pulled me through you know Mm -hmm. You, I made sure to go out and build relationships across and get to learn every other department. Therefore, by the end of it, you have gotten to know all the executives mm -hmm. in the different areas. And when that opening is coming, it's not that one person keeping you back, that other executive probably says at the table, what about that girl over there, Gina? Yeah. What do you yeah. think? And when they have eight people saying, let's go for it, and one person, something is wrong with that one person. Mm -hmm. So there are always going to be circumstances. Every right. piece of advice isn't going to work for everyone. Sure, we have true. to admit that there's some who come in. I'm speaking about the ones I interview, the oh, ones God. I hire, and they come in. I'm not kidding, Raquel, and I'm talking specifically with them. And they are literally doing the bare minimum. Ugh. They are already in their first conversation about mm -hmm. performance and growth opportunities and stuff, which is so important. Mm -hmm. All they want to know is next step. When will, how could I grow? Meaning yeah. how quickly can I move? But you yeah. just had a conversation where we're not actually fulfilling, you know, yeah. uh, the demands of the current role and right. my conversation, how can I support you to do that? So everything is relative and specific. Sure. Okay. In my personal career, I remember trying to be stopped by so many people around me. And one of the things, launch phase was very difficult, fast pace, sleepless nights for years, not months, okay, <laughs> years. And I, there was a lot of negativity around. That's one of the important things in focus on doing it, do the best. Yeah. And if you had to pick one person from the team of however many, eight or 10 or whatever it was, right? Why pick me and not the other one who is there longer than me? Right. If you stop to think about it is, well, I could have gone down the road of toxicity and saying, I'm going to, I leave in at five. I ain't doing that. I'm not going mm -hmm. 4 a.m. to the newspaper. I could have. Yeah. I get off track real fast. Yeah. But I didn't. And I could have. So in the scenarios and the moments where I remember could have kept me back, that piece of advice and yeah. the experience of some people coming in, that is not discounting the fact that obviously we face those challenges as women, you know, sure. um, in many circumstances and many situations, but you are responsible for not, um, for taking your life and making a change. Yeah. So as I said, I had to make some bold moves that may not have been the best moves, but I knew I was going to hit that glass ceiling potentially yeah. in a coup, maybe not from a woman, a leadership perspective, yeah. a woman, but from the reality of, listen, you're in a small market. Pick me, yeah. <laughs> pick me out of the millions they have to choose. Yeah. What did I do? Everybody said, this is a solid company, great package, great deal. Are you mad? What did I do? No, I'm not sticking it. I'm gone. Out. Next. Yeah. Let's let's take another opportunity that will maybe give me those opportunities. So, you know. <laughs> and that Coca-Cola is never going to come off your resume. So even if Digicel tanked so and never worked out, so you have Coca-Cola on your resume. You will find another job. So true. So and true. I and I would have had the experience anyway of Digicel. So, you know, you still have um, lots of lessons learned all the way. It's, it's still learning lessons all the time. So, yeah, And I agree so with you. That's a terrible thing to ask during an interviewer, because if you are not focused on the thing that it is that we're discussing that you're supposed to be doing, then... Yeah. Uh, then I think you been, yourself yeah. are the one that's keeping yourself back in sure. that example and that piece of advice. You know what yes. I mean? You're yourself. Yeah. Um, but that we should have a whole other interview, a whole other that conversation, other glass ceiling topic. That's a whole different interview we can have. <laughs> Absolutely. A whole, a whole, whole conversation. And I, I, you know, what I, what I advocate for is for understanding how your career is supposed to move. But I think you, you've honed in on something that people need to pay attention to. How are you performing in your current role? Because there is no room for growth or for moving. And even if it is that the role that you're in is not a good fit, for whatever reasons, find something that you are passionate about yes. and do that. Find the thing that, yes, I have bills to pay, but find the thing that you would do for free. And when you find that, do that. Because That's that right. is what will have you showing up as the kind of person who needs to grow. Absolutely. And Raquel, 
you will not always necessarily start off in that area of passion. No. I was lucky to start in marketing and that's what I loved. If you don't start in it, just if you, you, you know it, we all know it. People hire you, people grow you for everything else. Right, yeah. for everything else, that passion, you know, the, team the curiosity in you, the, the curiosity, curiosity. Yeah. the will to win, mm. that no matter what. So if I'm in finance, it doesn't matter. How can I make everything better for my team in here, process-wise? Yeah. How could we improve? How can we make coming to work, you know, something that will be a joy for everyone? Yeah. Maybe not yeah. every day. That's you trying to make a difference and make a change. That's passion. That's what people are hiring you for. And that's what people look for to grow you. Yeah. Yeah. Reality. Yeah. And that's so, the person in the corner who's back, who's who's talking about what's the next job? <laughs> yes. Or oh, don't worry, they're trying to milk you. I'll never forget that line. It's stuck with me. Don't stay past five. No, I'm like, but we have to finish this. It's due in the morning at eight. <laughs> like to me, that's not even a concept. Right. So it does show you your mindset is going to impact your future yes. growth. Yes. And how you feel about the work you're doing, yeah? Not just Correct. about, yeah, not just about whether somebody else sees you. How you feel about your willingness to go above and beyond yeah. will be affected by the thoughts that you allow yourself to have. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And for my own self pride, forget about the company's needs and goals. Yeah. I have to deliver. Yeah. They're like, oh yeah, Sasha, that one who never to. delivers. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Because it will impact my next job or of recommendation. So of stop course. thinking short term, instant yes. gratification. Think long game. You have to think the long game and suck the salt. Yeah. And you know, um, focus on you and the current role of that need. And anyway, when you do that, it's not only the company you're working for. You forgot you're there to serve customers. Yes. You're serving customers. They'll get to know you, love you, and maybe hire you and promote you later on. Exactly. Exactly. It's crazy where people end up. All right. So we've come back together. Yeah. <laughs> we've come back together. <laughs> we've come back together. <laughs> Wonderful. And then Sasha. we schedule a separate call. Yes, the, the glass topic. ceiling call. The glass <laughs> ceiling call. We're going to do it. This glass ceiling sticky floor call. But yeah. Sasha, thank you so much. I'm. You were worth the wait. You were worth oh, the right, chase. Yeah. <laughs> you're too funny but thank you so much was, i really enjoyed the conversation oh really great thank you for having me absolutely thank you so much for staying with us and through this conversation we really appreciate you please if you don't already subscribe to the podcast and and follow us on socials if you're appreciating the content and learning new things i know i learned a lot from sasha today i loved the the concept of just being curious and how that just pulled her through her career but also willing to to go above and beyond and being willing to take a chance especially when you weigh the you know what do i have to lose it's so important that you you know yeah. be willing to take a chance because she literally got on a rocket that went to space did you sell stuff a lot of people you know know dennis o'brien and they're like oh well he's irish and they think well this was an irish conglomerate that came to the caribbean he started this thing in jamaica and then right. moved to trinidad and it has absolutely bloomed and blossomed and when you get an invitation to get on a rocket ship get on the worst that could happen is that it fails spectacularly and then you resume your career in progress so thank absolutely. you so much and i can't wait to see you till next time bye thank you raquel